But there's a chapter two in this process. Um, and I talk about this as um, my encounter with care. We talked about the ultimate encounter or what have you. We've been talking about that. And <clears throat> I once had to give a talk or a little presentation to a group of fellow colleagues who had come into Chicago. And um, one of the category was care. And I told a story that uh, my whole life, up until not too long before that, I thought care was something I had. I, ca I cared. And life was about budgeting your care, you know? Okay, what do you care about? Well, I care about my family. Okay, I care about my job. I care about my lawn. I care about my dog. I care about my community. I care, you know, so you got this spectrum of relationships that, quote, call for your care. And so what life was about is budget. Okay, I can budget so much care for here and so much for there and so much for there. And life was about balancing the budget. And it would get out of balance. And, you know, you're ignoring your family or you're ignoring your job or what have you. But it was, you know, you, you manage your budget. And I was pretty smug and pretty, you know, confident that I was doing a pretty damn good job. I was working in the inner city, but I had a nice family. I could give care to that. I cared for my church. I cared, and so on and so forth. And I was really good. And then I took this course called RS1. And all of a sudden now, care took on a different reality. And I've talked to you a little bit before about what I call the vocational question. What are you going to do with your life? What is, where is the, the one thrust or the, or the deed to which is fundamentally your life is about? You have lots of activities, but your life needs to be about something. And that something cannot be defined by somebody else. You cannot live that something as if an ought you ought to be doing this. You ought to be in the poor. You ought to be there. You ought to be here. You ought to be with your family. That's your first obligation. So you're, you're in the midst of this stew. And, and after I took that course, that stew was going on because I was a research scientist. And I felt like I was fulfilling a long time dream of being a scientist. I wanted to be a scientist ever since I could remember. Um, so I had books on astronomy. My had a wonderful um, aunt who, no, she was a cousin, I'm sorry, who uh, would always ship, give my brother and I books, which we didn't like, you know, we wanted toys. She would get books. And, but my books were all science, you know. There was a book on snakes. I'll never forget that. And then there was another book and so on. And I became um, deeply committed to science. This was in the 50s. And I knew I wanted to be a nuclear physicist. I just knew because that was the new atomic age and was going to solve all the problems and I wanted to be a scientist and, and I knew exactly what I was going to do and how I was going to be. Well, there was a couple of detours, one called calculus and some others, to which nuclear physics went out. But I got a chance to get into chemistry and I became an organic chemist, went to graduate school and then got a job with B.F. Goodrich Company and working in their chemical division. And I had, a, I had a great time, a great time. I had all these years of, uh, well, they used to call our research center the country club because there was no, quote, pressure. You guys are just out there, could do any damn thing you wanted, you know, and everybody, all, every rest of us have to work, you guys, and so on. So there was a, a lot of animosity from the rest of the company about those of us who were in this ivory tower. All we had to do was think and play. So I had a, this lovely challenge, and I talked to you a little bit about, I had some success. And I made the company a lot of money, of which I saw none. Um, but I enjoyed it. I loved it. 
And then, but I was involved with the Institute at the time. And I, again, I was balancing. Beautiful job. Here was my volunteer work with the uh, Institute of Cultural Affairs, Ecumenical Institute. Here was my job. And I had this incredibly balanced railroad track to which I was straddled to. I had a career, had a job, and then I had all this activity here. And as far as I could tell, the railroad track was just fine, and I rode it until all of a sudden I began to see it's split, it's dividing. <laughs> They're not going down the same direction. And it was harder and harder to balance this. I took a leave of absence from my work to go work with the Institute, came back. Six months later, I asked him for another leave of absence. Anyhow, the story of it is this. <clears throat> uh, the, we had a, uh, in our labs, we had different uh, labs, one next to the other. And the, 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 the man who was in the lab next to mine was retiring. We threw a party for him. And he went away, and, and I came in the next day, and I peeked in the window, and, you know, the desk was all clean, and you kind of wonder, who's going to move in there? And on the door, for all of our doors, was our name tag, and it was a, a vinyl strip put into a slot. And it was him. He'd taken it, or they had taken it out. I didn't know which. And my door was right here, and I saw my name. And I said, damn, someday... There's going to be a different name there. I'm, I'm, go I'm going to be gone. Now, that sounds logical, okay? This was not logical. This hit me like a ton of bricks. You will be gone from here, and someone else, probably much more competent, certainly paid more, will be doing what you're doing. I went in and I sat down. And I visualized the next 20, 30 years of activity. And I looked at all the different things I might work on, and I looked back, and I looked at the 10 years I'd already had. And damn, if that didn't look just like that. More of the same. Fun, yes. Fulfilling, in a way, yes. Meaningful, yes. Making a difference, yes. But that phrase that we now use, have been there, done that, all of a sudden was echoing in my head, and I realized there are thousands of people can do what I'm doing. Thousands. Probably better. And I said, you know, that's the day I left. Now it took three years of courage to build up the courage, and a divorce, and several other... <laughs> existential crises for me to walk out the door. But I did. And so, and I talk about this talk, I said, there is, that's when I discovered that care isn't something that you have that you budget. Care has you. Care is an objective reality to which you get to participate in care. And that, that, was, that was a revolutionary thought in my mind. Because what I told the people in the, in the talk was that when you grasp that care has you rather than you have care, then you realize that your care will take you where you do not want to go. You don't want to go there. But at some point, you've got to make a decision. <laughs> Either I'm, I'm, I'm authentically c connected to that care which has my name on it, or I turn and walk some other way and deny that connectivity. Now you can call that the calling, you can call that a vocation, there's lots of names for it. But I believe each and every person has an opportunity to encounter that care. And it won't necessarily be something, you know, noble, like I'm called to be a teacher, I'm called to be a poet, I'm called to be a, a builder, or what have you. Those are all fantastic. But I believe each and every person has a life to which that question is 
the point, a point of reference for all things that are happening. And when they discover what that point is, then life begins to take on a significance. They begin, as we talked about here, they begin to build a story around whatever that isness is, whatever that uniqueness is. And therefore, they begin to build their own mythology, their own self story of authenticity. Not of convenience, not of, of this is why I'm doing something. But this is what I have, and they may not use these words, which I don't care. They may not call it a calling. They may not say I'm responding to something that I do not know. They just find a home. They find a resonance in what they're doing that makes them feel alive. And that's the test. To wit, to what thing do you respond to which you feel alive? Not excited, no. Alive. As if life itself was saying, this is for you.